Good morning, Commissioner Bush. Welcome to Brooks. Good morning. Great to be with you. So uh, we are very excited to let you know that we have students from both of our high schools with us here today. We uh, in the the red shirts, you're going to see the students from Brooks Collegiate Academy, and the school leader is uh, Coach Monique Almasan. And then the students that will be in either orange or, or black shirts are going to be the students from our flagship school, Brooks Academy of Science and Engineering. And their principal is also here, Ms. Bonnie Salas. Good morning. Good morning. And we are ready to go whenever you're ready to start your lesson. We're ready for you. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask for Karina to uh, just give a thumbs up or text me before we begin, just to let her let me know that uh, she's ready to go with our Texas Commissioner's Map uh, to get started. But I appreciate everybody joining uh, the line and wanted to take this opportunity to introduce myself. Um, yes, this is a virtual background. Um, not, not a real background, but uh, mm -hmm. is our agency logo. Um, the uh, Texas Land Office uh, takes on a variety of different roles, and so I want to take a little bit of time to explain that before we get into the map. I see that Karina has put up the, uh, the commissioner's map. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you, uh, if you uh, can see that on your screen. Excellent. Okay. So at the Land Office, um, we have a variety of, of important roles. I break it down to uh, four important roles. One is uh, what you see before you, and that's maintaining the state's history and archives. In fact, in the Stephen F. Austin, when the pandemic is over, we welcome you anytime to Austin to visit, where we maintain over 40 million documents and archives dating back to the Spanish crown. Um, we also are the day-to-day -day manager of the grounds of the Alamo. So for, uh, for those of you that have friends or relatives, next time you're in San Antonio, make sure to let our staff know that you know uh, Land Commissioner Bush and we'll try to hook you up with a nice tour uh, behind the scenes. Um, we also are the coastal manager for the state. So perfect opportunity to take a look at the map there. Texas is very unique in that we successfully negotiated uh, ownership of our own coastal lands. So you, uh, the future of Texas actually own from the Sabine Pass of Texas all the way down to South Padre Island, very unique among uh, Gulf Coast states, uh, which has benefited uh, education throughout our state. And we'll have a chance to talk about that later in the lesson. Third, we are the uh, asset manager for the state. And so um, as we get deeper into the map, you'll see the vast natural resources that Texas has been blessed with. And over time that has resulted in billions of dollars in funding for public education, whether it's K through 12, uh, public charter schools, or even post-secondary education universities like Te University of Texas and uh, Texas A&M. Several good schools that I know several of you will apply to in, in a matter of years. Uh, finally, we are the first responder to natural disasters in Texas. So uh, we're obviously dealing with a, a natural disaster, the likes of which we have never uh, witnessed before in our lifetimes here in Texas. Um, and we will be playing a standby role with the, the governor's office to make sure that we're helping our state recover. Uh, but our primary role stems back to Hurricanes Ike and Dolly, where uh, over a decade ago, uh, our agency was entrusted with uh, helping the federal government uh, recover Texas, not only from residential housing, but also from a commercial um, real estate uh, perspective. So uh, we have turned a big corner in terms of Hurricane Harvey and have helped uh, over 100,000 Texans recover from uh, this nat natural disaster. So we can start today's lesson with uh, the energy map of Texas. Now, a little known fact about uh, the land office is that each land commissioner um, in modern times has had the uh, opportunity to draft their own map. And so I did my own research when I came into office in 2014 and no prior land commissioner had devoted their map to energy in Texas. And I thought that that was um, really surprising considering that we are the energy leader, uh, not only for the country, but the world. In fact, uh, before the pandemic, our state was producing about 5 million barrels of oil. So if we were our own country, we would have been a, a top 10 producer um, and certainly the largest producer in, in the country that is now uh, producing more oil and gas than, than any other country before the pandemic. 
So we put together this map, and uh, as you can tell, it's uh, more of an infographic. Um, so it's meant to tell history. It, it, we took all the major on the side lot, on the side columns, you'll see every major event affecting energy in Texas dating back to the Spanish crown in 1543, all the way to the current day. Uh, you will see on the top column, different forms of energy that are developed, ranging from wind to the downstream process of, of refining. Um, I also have my mission statement um, in the panhandle, just kind of where New Mexico would be, um, stating that we need to develop all forms of energy. It's not just about uh, oil and gas. There's also tremendous opportunities to develop wind and solar, and we're actually seeing that in the post-COVID-19 uh, environment that we all face. Um, a little bit further to the right, you will see barrels of oil. That's meant to signify how much money has been contributed to the permanent school fund and to the permanent university fund. Permanent school fund benefits public education, including uh, public charter schools in Texas. Permanent university fund supports University of Texas and Texas A&M. And as you can see, a lot more barrels occurring since 2005 with uh, the beginning of the shale revolution occurring in, uh, in, uh, in the Texas geology. Um, finally, I'll, I'll just point out um, that on the bottom left-hand corner of the map, you will see another form of Texas. Um, and in that, um, you will see the geology uh, of the state. So if we go a little bit yeah, further down to the left, you'll see the geological boundaries so this is really, it's essentially a map of Texas below our feet, below the surface. Um, and what has been explored by oil and gas developers really dating back to Spindletop. Um, our second map that we'll look at, we'll, di we'll dive a little bit deeper into the East Texas uh, geology uh, in the East Texas basin and the Sabine uplift, which was uh, one of the first geological discoveries. But as you can see, a lot of uh, resource in West Texas Midland Basin, Delaware Basin. And most of what you see in Delaware Basin, the green circle there is uh, what we manage at the General Land Office, um, close to about 7 million acres in total uh, with the remaining portion in coastal areas of Texas. Uh, so with that introduction of the map, I wanted to give um, our students about five minutes to look at it um, on your own. I believe we've provided a, a link for you to be able to to download it and have a chance to check it out on your own. Um, during this time, I want you to think about some um, primary objectives and maybe some conclusions about uh, not only the current energy picture in Texas, but also the future, what it, what it may contain. Um, and if any questions come up at all, feel free to text me. I have access to um, the text chain. So um, as questions come up in the next five minutes, let me know and uh, we'll go through that. So as you all have a chance to, to look through the map, um, we can also hone in on a few other items on the map. Um, if you'll see, you know, most of the activity um, really is in West Texas. And there's different historic timelines that are called out, uh, ranging from oil and gas well development to the first wind farm turbines that are uh, developed in Texas in 2006. As, as you can see, there's uh, a vast amount of um, wind farms. In fact, a lot of scientists and engineers say the wind patterns in West Texas are among the strongest uh, to develop uh, wind power. In fact, Texas as a state produces more wind power than any other state uh, in the country. Um, most of that development you'll see is in the Abilene Sweetwater area. 
So uh, what's exciting about uh, the state of Texas work is, is that we have uh, completed a multi-billion dollar transmission line that transports power from these areas uh, as far away as El Paso, but mainly to the Metroplex to be able to sell power to large urban areas. Uh, I have one text that has come in from, from Stephen. How does wind energy compare to other energy like uh, oil and coal as far as cost? Very good question. Um, before the pandemic, um, oil and gas was uh, of an elevated price, uh, to be honest. And so uh, many were saying that uh, wind and solar were becoming uh, equally as cost competitive as, as oil and gas. Now I'm looking at my TV screen, oil being priced close to $29 per barrel WTI uh, makes it a little bit more competitive, but uh, wind is certainly becoming a, a lot cheaper to produce, which makes it uh, better for the consumer in a deregulated environment like, uh, like Texas. Uh, another great question from Heather coming in uh, from the TEA commissioner. Can you speak to the difference between owning land and owning mineral rights? This is a, <laughs> a very expensive question that uh, at the land office we try our best to address because we are in the courthouse uh, with producers and uh, with fellow landowners all the time over who owns what. Um, because our portfolio, as I mentioned, is in excess of 7 million acres of a very large uh, portion of what you see in Reeves County, uh, which is uh, just west of the Pecos River. And so uh, most of the tracts of uh, land that we own at the land office are actually partially owned by surface rights owners. Um, and we, as the mineral right owner, have to split some of those proceeds with the, uh, the land owner. So in many instances in Texas, you'll have a surface right owner and a mineral right owner. There's pretty established law in terms of uh, who the royalty owner is on oil and gas development, but there's still some conflict over uh, other natural resources like um, caliche, um, gravel, and other types of uh, substances that can be used for, um, for oil and gas uh, developments throughout the, uh, the Midland Basin. So it's actually a very um, expensive question that sometimes gets litigated in today's courthouses. Uh, Savannah has another question. Do you think that the situation with oil caused by the pandemic will lead to a greater initiative to switch to green energy? So one of the interesting aspects that scientists have already discovered is that uh, as a state, we've already re uh, we've released 10% less CO2 than we did before the pandemic just by uh, less people driving and getting on the roads. Uh, people, however, are speculating that we're releasing more methane in, in West Texas now that some of the EPA rules have uh, been relaxed in terms of what can and cannot be released into the air. Uh, so we still need more studies and more information to understand where the, the balance is. Uh, but it, with less CO2 emissions, it's certainly changing the way that we're uh, discussing energy, um, not only in the context of how we produce it, but how we use it. And um, with less traffic on the roads, certainly people, uh, I'm calling you today from Austin, uh, people are more excited to have less traffic than we usually do. Uh, so it may actually result in, in different ways in which we design our cities and how we uh, get around, whether that's ride sharing, micro mobility, um, or, or public transportation. So the pandemic will have a, an interesting aspect. Um, and some even say that global demand won't be where it was before the pandemic at 100 million barrels uh, of oil a day. Okay, so with that, um, we can go into, and I'll ask uh, Karina to go into the left column showing significant events and pipeline. Just for your future reference on the map, um, we have different columns here available to you, different overlays that we provided. Um, so this isn't only a physical map that we've produced, but a digital map. So we constantly update this. Feel free to check out our website where uh, we constantly refresh this information. Uh, here's one column, for example, our history icons, um, where dating back to 1543. And for any of your questions on the endowment itself, uh, permanent school fund lands, the university endowment, or even events like uh, Spindle Top in 1901, which we'll uh, talk a little bit about in our next map, and uh, you know other significant infrastructure locations like the Houston Chip Channel, you'll find in that column. 
Next column is uh, conventional drilling. For those of you that might be interested in uh, the way that drilling occurred in the past, which was mainly vertical wells, straight down uh, underneath the ground rather than uh, hydraulic fracturing or horizontal drilling, which you may have heard about. Um, we have a column devoted to uh, one state lease where we have vertical drilling in uh, the greater Houston area. Speaking of horizontal drilling, we uh, have a column that explains how that process worked with uh, the Eagle Ford Shale uh, using, using as a, a prime example of, of how that shale rock was uh, developed through horizontal techniques. And then, you know, as I mentioned on the physical map, I, there's a geological um, study of, of Texas. This is constantly changing because oil and gas uh, developers um, and other miners, uh, for that matter, that look for natural or precious metals uh, will tell, sometimes report to agencies like ours updates to the geology of Texas. So this is an important topic that we're finding more about in uh, the oil and gas industry and that, that relates to pipelines. Um, there are new pipelines being developed every day that connect the Permian Basin to areas like Corpus Christi, which is now exporting more oil than any other port in uh, the country. And so uh, this is also an evolving landscape, but as you can see, it takes a lot of pipe to get uh, oil and gas to the Gulf Coast of Texas predominantly to refine this for petroleum products, including uh, chemicals and plastics that we use in everyday, everyday items. This also shows the abundant resource of natural gas in, in Texas. Again, constantly evolving, constantly finding new discoveries and in a readily available resource that can be used to help us reduce CO2 emissions, whether that's in the form of transportation or combined cycle operations that produce power in hot uh, days like who knows today will be a little bit warmer today. This is uh, an example of coal power. Wind energy. And we talked about mostly, you'll see West Texas panhandle, even in uh, South Texas, we'll, you'll see some pretty strong wind patterns. And a, uh, a hot area of discussion, no pun intended, is solar. Uh, West Texas has tremendous uh, rays. In fact, many areas around El Paso get over 300 solid days of sun per year, which allows a solar developer to, uh, to develop that resource. And so that's, that's our energy map in a nutshell. With that, we could probably go to um, our second map that we wanted to share with you, and this is straight from the GLO Archives uh, Records Office, where, as I mentioned, we maintain millions of documents, including really interesting maps dating back to, um, in this case, in the oil and gas business, one of the first oil finds in East Texas. Um, I'm going to allow um, the students to review this for about five minutes again. Feel free to zoom in on this. For those of us that are 44 years old, I needed to pull out my glasses. Um, some of the writing is very uh, fine, so you'll need to, uh, to really dive in there to understand a lot of what's written in the map. But I wanted to give you a few moments to review it yourself. Again, I'm available on group chat if you have any questions as they come up, and then we'll take a few min minutes to discuss this map. Also feel free to unmute your microphones and uh, ask me questions directly. Uh, Eric Perez asked, with the use of turbines in Texas, how do you avoid killing the birds when using and installing these turbines? 
That's an important question. What we found in South Texas were that environmentalist groups and even the defense industry came together um, against the development of, of wind energy for exactly that reason, that it was uh, resulting in, in a lot of bird strikes that were killing uh, or changing migratory bird patterns. Um, many people say that on the Texas Gulf Coast that we have more biodiversity among uh, aviary species than any other area of North America. And so if we, so we have to be very cautious and put uh, the time in to study how uh, wind energy is affecting uh, our environment. Having said that, you know, in West Texas, we have less of those issues, as you can imagine. Um, for those that have spent time in, in Sweetwater, Abilene area, where you'll see a lot more wind farm developments and less uh, concerns provided by, uh, by environmentalists. Having said that, um, a lot of ranch owners, landowners do complain about what they call flicker effect at night, where um, some of the red lights will actually uh, pretty, be pretty uh, large and pronounced and affect uh, property values for ranchers and farmers in West Texas. So to kick off the uh, discussion on the, oh, and I should also mention before I start off the discussion on the map, is the Dark Skies Initiative. So in, um, in West Texas, as I mentioned, we manage over 7 million acres. And with flaring of gas, you will sometimes at night affect uh, the ability of uh, laboratories, whether it's the McDonald's uh, Observatory in, um, in Presidio County or uh, the, the effects that it has on everyday way of life that uh, we've been working with private industry to look at ways in which we can deflect light downward as opposed to upward um, because the state of Texas has made a significant investment in, in star observations and planetary observations out of McDonald Observatory. So uh, an important initiative that we're undertaking with Apache, a, a great company out of Houston. So to kick off the discussion on the, uh, the, the 37 map, so you may have had a chance to see that the date of it um, is, is not exactly exact. And also another whimsical uh, tribute on the map is right what you see before me where it says things change so rapidly in the world's greatest oil field, it is useless to attempt to be accurate. This is a, uh, a stark contrast to the first map that we shared, mainly because we used satellite imagery, all the latest and greatest technology to make it as exact as it possibly could. Whereas this map clearly says up front to the reader, this is not accurate. Um, accuracy is important in map making and, and one development that's occurred since, uh, since the 37 map. Um, also, what you'll find are um, interesting uh, titles that are dedicated to characters and figures on the map, whether it is uh, what you'll see at the bottom of this under Winona, where it says, Lodo lawyers on way to Tyler to get injunctions. Um, you'll see uh, hitchhikers called out, um, refineries, royalty buyers, escrow men, hitchhikers, even um, a caricature called hot oil, which um, is meant to describe stolen oil in the middle of the night. Um, th this is uh, an interesting take on an oil town at the time. It's a boom town where literally people from all over the country are um, trying to take advantage of this uh, great opportunity. Um, you also have to remember that this map is, is drafted during the Great Depression in the 1930s. And many say that we're facing potentially a depression in the current pandemic. Uh, but at this time, this is uh, after uh, potentially seven years of an economic downturn. So you have people from all over the country hitchhiking, attempting to find ways to, uh, to make money even setting up hot dog stands, as it's called out, tourist cabins, gas stations, to service the, uh, the oil industry. Another interesting aspect of the map is that we have, uh, in the middle of what we have up with, uh, on, on the screen is the oil well fire, the Sinclair One, uh, which took the toll of nine lives. So it speaks to the danger of, of actually working some of these rigs uh, in the 30s. Even to this day, there are sometimes safety uh, protocols that are, that are not observed. In fact, uh, we once taught a class close to where there was a rig explosion earlier in the year where uh, one worker actually died on site. And so even in the modern day, it sometimes can be 
a well-paying job, but at times uh, a, a dangerous job. But I know uh, the industry does what it can to, to make sure that all workers are, are safe and, and taken care of. A little bit further up on the map, you'll see the original find of uh, the Sinclair well. And um, again, it speaks to how crazy things get when um, the, the resources developed. We hope that the same craziness will occur uh, in alternative energy in Texas. But um, the first well in Gray County discovered in 1931. So the map is actually made in 37 and looks back at the last few years in terms of how many of these small East Texas towns really did not have uh, a lot of economic development at the time, but with the development of the resource, uh, really saw things take off. And so in thinking about uh, how, the, how we could follow up and find more information and confirm the accuracy of these aspects within the map, um, there are different ways in which a historian like yourself could actually find that information. First, checking out local and state newspapers, old business records, checking city government records. For a lot of folks in the energy business, whether it is an alternatives or in oil and gas, we spent a lot of time in the courthouse checking title, checking court records to see who owns what. And so um, I'm not sure if we should, had a chance to share legal, legal terms with you in terms of who receivers are and royalty buyers, railroad commission man is one box is called out, uh, or even the bus loaded with suckers. You'll, you'll see that there's a high element of law uh, associated with clearing title, settling disputes, uh, as they occurred, sometimes resulting even in gunfights between uh, disputed uh, parties. And so, uh, assuming no questions from uh, the students, I wanted to ask a few questions of you and then we can um, uh, have a discussion about both of the maps that I wanted to pose to you. Um, first of all, thinking about what you learned about Texas energy production, from the two maps. Again, the, first, the second map being from 1937 and the second in the modern day. Um, and to begin a discussion of where you think energy production in Texas is going. Uh, so I'll allow you a few moments to think about that and uh, we'll take the discussion from there. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few questions while you think about that. Uh, I'm not a native Texan from Savannah, but I was wondering if Texas has any relationship with nuclear energy and why or why not. Uh, if we could go back, Rena, to the modern map. Little known fact is that Texas does uh, develop nuclear energy. Two facilities in Texas, one very close to where I used to live in, in Granbury, Texas, and close to Fort Worth. And uh, when I first ran for office, I had a chance to, to visit it myself. And uh, amazing ability to produce energy without any carbon emission whatsoever. So it does not pollute uh, the environment while producing. However, storing nuclear energy is a different matter and one that uh, the Texas legislature has attempted to address over time. But the first facility, as the modern map calls out, is in 1988. Um, as a percentage of overall production in, of power in Texas, it's actually nuclear only is a small percentage. Um, at, you know, it's interesting, I had a chance to visit uh, Japan uh, after the Fukushima incident, and I had a chance to visit with experts there about their experience with uh, the tsunami that impacted one of their nuclear facilities, and it was a nuclear fallout, probably the most devastating one globally since Chernobyl. And Japan has no intent to build any new nuclear facilities. Uh, that incident that occurred close to a decade ago um, to this day has uh, an indelible impact on global energy production that has honestly scared uh, policy leaders from developing new nuclear facilities. And so um, it's, it, it has a lot of promise, a lot of potential. In fact, there are scientists in Europe working on nuclear fusion, not fission, 
uh, that could potentially create even more energy than, than the standard nuclear uh, production. So a lot, a lot to learn from it, uh, from the Fukushima incident, from safety protocols, and scientists and engineers hopefully will, will uh, perfect a way in which we could look at even a stronger way to generate uh, energy. Another question from Eric, well, that was the bird strike one on uh, from Bianca, based on recent events, isn't Russia and Saudi Arabia hurting themselves by deflating oil prices? They are, and, and that's what's confusing about the, the entire global shock. So um, with global supply and demand being at 100 million barrels a day before this incident, suddenly dropping to about 65 million to 70 million, a 30% cut in demand, uh, the Russians and the Saudis um, had a disagreement in terms of how much to cut, and that resulted in the Saudis flooding the market with uh, cheap oil, which resulted in prices going negative. In fact, the last class I taught, as we were teaching the class, oil went negative. As I was looking at the TV screen, my jaw dropped. I'd never seen that before. It has never occurred in, in the modern era. Um, but now that they're... Um, is there's a there's a, a temporary compromise between uh, OPEC uh, and OPEC plus as it's called and the United States that has reduced supply we think to about 80 million barrels so there's still uh, a little bit of a difference there in oversupply uh, but you're absolutely right the Saudis and the Russians rely upon stable oil prices more so than the United States mainly because they fund most of their public budget off of uh, oil and gas development um, so long term um, you know, it's safe to say that uh, we need to work at ways in which, you know, in Texas, in the United States, that we provide stable sources of energy in the event that there is a future uh, crisis. And um, last month's developments were an example of why we need to do that. Next question from, uh, from Ray. Thank you for your question, Ray. Uh, good to see you virtually. Oil and energy have major geopolitical and national defense ramifications. What has Texas energy meant to U.S. national security and is there a way the U.S. can team with Mexico and Canada to be even stronger? Absolutely. As part of our national security, uh, you have to have a stable source of, of energy supply. If, but for the Shell Revolution of the last decade, if we did not have that s sustainable and reliable source of energy, we'd be subject to the whims of countries like uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, and the Middle East. And so, uh, the fact that we've been able to develop this partnership economically and politically with Mexico and Canada with a, an updated free trade agreement, it allows us to look at this issue um, with even uh, a stronger partnership. And so uh, I think that uh, when the discussions occur, whether it's in the Texas Railroad Commission or in the White House in terms of how the United States would respond to the pandemic crisis, the fact that we were able to work that deal with Mexico for their production uh, cut and Canada, um, I think presents an opportunity for our three countries to become the new Middle East, to become its own OPEC, not necessarily in a cartel fashion, but that's, that's based on market principles and that allows us to have a strong voice, particularly here in Texas. As more questions come in, um, I wanted to uh, maybe kickstart the conversation as it related to the future of Texas energy. And I think it goes back to the prior question on, on nuclear energy. What we try to show in this map is the importance of all sources of energy, not just oil and gas, but also alternatives. And in the map, you'll see that we have uh, solar energy developed, wind, nuclear was called out, hydroelectric as well. And what's not called out in the map and that we hope to update for you as well in the near future is the fact that we have precious metals that are being mined. And speaking, Ray, of, new, of uh, national security issues, we have the ability to develop lithium and other precious metals that have the opportunity to be a large source of, uh, of stability for the development of everything from iPhones to computers and substances that are used by Department of Defense. And that can be um, another source of strength for our, our country's national security.
Any other questions from the students? So I guess I have a few questions for the students myself. Uh, how is the how's remote learning working? Do you like digital learning? And I see a, a young man shaking his head no. <laughs> Sebastian, when you want you want to take off your uh, mute button and expand? Uh, it's just different. Yeah. Because I've been doing something the same for my whole life, and then it just switched abruptly. So. It's just something to change to. Do you think you'll uh, learn to uh, appreciate it or because, I mean, let's be honest, there may be a second wave. And so I know that the teachers on the call are potentially preparing next year for uh, a return to, to remote learning. Uh, I think, yeah, I'll change to it eventually, but it won't happen right away. So what any do you others, think about it? Any others want to jump in on that? Jason. Oh, he does. Uh, That's fun. Do you have any kids? I do. Yeah. So right before this class, I wrapped up a kindergarten class. So this is oh, more really? stimulating. No, no offense to my son. He's uh, seven years old and uh, we're, we're learning both Spanish and English. But yeah, we wrapped up a, an hour session. So I feel like I've become a, um, a multitasking teacher as of late. Oh, no, it's cool, right, sir? I mean, uh, like the baby, my, my little sisters, they date, um, like they take these classes for their daycare, but I mean, all they're doing is just sitting in front of the iPad and just, you know, just trying to have conversation. But like for us, it's, it's different, you know? Like we have to do all these classes, we have to go on all these websites, but uh, I guess at the end of the day, it's just, it feels a little bit more uh, like unorganized, you know what I mean? And it's harder mm -hmm. to get uh, more stabilized in this situation for like work and stuff. Cause I can't just put a planner on and look at it every day. Cause it feels, it doesn't feel the same. You know, I'm not doing physical work. I'm just yeah. uh, doing work that I see that my teacher posted. And if I don't get what my teacher posted, then I can't really do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, for, I, you know, I would call it up to, fifth grade students, you really have to sit and be present with the student while they're interacting with their teacher online. So really, you're, you're increasing the requirement for adults with, with children. But I would say that for middle schoolers and high schoolers, the transition has been easier when talking with parents uh, throughout the state, that it's a little bit easier to follow a curriculum uh, online. But, you know, one of the, we've talked about this change, but you know, this change is actually already occurring in a lot of universities where uh, some of the fastest growing enrollments that you'll find in, you know, Oklahoma, for example, or even here in Texas are online learning. And so, um, so hopefully we can all learn to embrace this. It is a challenge for sure um, to absorb it, but, you know, uh, being accountable and held accountable by your friends and by your fellow students and by your teachers, hopefully will make that a little bit easier. Uh, we have a text question. Any vast changes from here to now in the present day on collecting oil and energy? And is there any other new sufficient tax tactics that help gain energy? So conservation is, uh, is an important issue. What we're, you know, as I mentioned, our Dark Skies Initiative is an important one. Working on flaring is uh, probably the hottest topic right now that we're, uh, we're dealing with in West Texas. But there, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in technology. Technology is changing the game in energy. And right now, if you look at Elon Musk and, and Bill Gates and other uh, investors, they're putting money into battery storage technology. So, you know, I'd mentioned the challenge in developing solar and wind power in desolate areas of Texas and transporting that through power lines. What if we were able to store that power as we develop it in desolate areas of Texas and then either rail it or uh, transport it by 18 wheelers to populated areas like Houston, like Dallas, like Austin and San Antonio, that could be a game changing, um, a, a game changing aspect to energy development and allows us to, to save energy in the process. Uh, Jalen is asking, is the COVID-19 going to come back again in fall? Well, you know, this is forcing a lot of uh, elected leaders like myself to uh, research this as closely as possible. And a lot of epidemiologists 
and folks that, that study pandemics say that there is a, a good possibility. Dr. Fauci in the White House task force himself has said that there's a, a fair, using his words, a fair possibility of that occurring. So I, you know, if I were a gambling person, that's probably a one in two chance. And part of that is uh, the challenge that we face in terms of reopening uh, our communities. Now, as we're able to go into hair salons and to restaurants and to, um, into other locations, whether they be retail or, or school, there is that possibility that we have other outbreaks. So as that occurs, you know, my hope is that we get better in terms of testing, in terms of contact tracing, so that we can find quickly where hotspots are and then respond accordingly. How will 5G technology affect the oil industry, if at all? That's, that's a good question. You know, a lot of uh, workers that we interact with in the Permian Basin have communication issues. Uh, rural broadband is important for your average worker in the oil and gas field. And so based upon a cursory knowledge of what's occurring with 5G technology, it gives the chance for the worker to be better connected to not only their employer, but also to their loved ones and their family. A lot of uh, workers, if they're working on an offshore well or uh, working in deep West Texas, they want to have that connectivity. And so um, whether it's in alternative energy, wind, solar development, a lot of workers are, are forced to be in, in uh, desolate areas of the state. So it could actually um, be a game changer for the average um, living experience for the worker. Question from Astrid, how do, how do you see the Texas economy rebounding from quarantine? That's, that's a really difficult question. You know, a lot of economists say, you know, V-shaped recovery, L-shaped recovery, U-shaped you know, I, I don't know if we can really say if it's going to be either one of those three. The good news is that Texas has always been a leader. So our last financial crisis in 2008, Texas created um, close to two out of every five new jobs in our country as we were recovering from that crisis, largely led by the energy industry. Um, this time around will be a little bit different because of the demand picture that we've talked about uh, globally with the, the pandemic. So. I honestly think that it'll be led by small business. It'll be led by retail, the service industry, industries outside of, of energy, whereas energy right now is, is dealing with the change, the likes of which we haven't even seen, even during the 80s banking crisis, where there were massive amounts of bankruptcies and, and foreclosures. Um, so I think it'll be a diversified recovery and technology we're seeing is changing the way that people do business, the, how they live their lives. and and even right now, um, learning uh, through the education process. Thank you for thanking me, Jalen, for, uh, for the text. Uh, Adina, you mentioned how most universities are now moving to online classes. Do you believe that universities are gonna open up with in-person classes? This is uh, another area of controversy. So Texas State will have the second summer semester open starting in August, and they are the earliest that I'm aware of in Texas of the public universities. But right now, University of Texas, um, in fact, front page in the Austin American Statesman is planning for all of their 14 universities to be open in the fall. AM has already made that call and AM is hoping to have football back starting in, in the fall as well. So again, this is a, a moving target. You know, we're all, all learning as part of this process, but the universities in Texas are, are planning to open in the fall. From Victoria, if the pandemic flares again in the fall, how's the government prepared to handle this? What will change? You know, this is um, the new normal. You know, this is something that we've seen with, uh, with other pandemics. And um, as a parent, and in the discussion that we had on being a working parent, um, it, it changes the analysis because you can't only think about yourself, you have to think about uh, your children. So that's why schools are really the foundation uh, of our state. And so planning around uh, that, I know is a, is a challenge for a lot of leadership. One very important question that we're dealing with are, are schools that don't have digital access and working from home while the parent is away working, can you have access to an iPad, to a computer, to a phone to access your classes? So I know that in visiting with the, our education commissioner, Mike Morath, that there are ways in which um, students, parents are able to download work, say for example, on a Monday, um, as Jason had mentioned, perhaps working on that work during the week and then uploading it on a Friday afternoon to show to your teacher that you've completed that work. Uh, so there are different ways in which we're 
you know, adapting to this situation. And I know that teachers and administrators during the summer are really going to be spending a lot of time thinking about uh, the event if there is a relapse. But we're all hoping that that, that is not the case. Uh, Mia says, we all know emotion, uh, emissions have come down, but with overstock on barrels and companies resorting to flaring, will the emissions be better or worse by the end of this? Uh, another great question, because we, we really don't know the net effect of the reduction of, of not driving as much, um, but also at the same time flaring in West Texas. The estimate that I shared with you before does contemplate uh, the flaring issue that we're seeing in West Texas. And we're still waiting for guidance from the EPA in terms of when they will return back to the normal standards on, on flaring activity. I know that at the land office before the pandemic, we just passed a historic emission standard policy. And, and this is where we can enforce existing rules on, on producers. Um, but we still have to wait for this data since, I, not that I'm counting, I think this is day 53 of, uh, uh, of not being able to go to work that um, we still have to study the information as, as it comes to us. But on a net net basis, globally, there's been a, a reduction in CO2, largely just with less economic activity, less air travel, uh, less car transportation, uh, not only in our country, but throughout the world. Uh, Isabel is asking, how do you see the environmental change after quarantine? You know, again, th th I think, the, the, large, the larger picture will be studying the information after the fact. And we probably need a good several months, if not a year at least, to really study what this means. We are a car-driven culture here in Texas, and it remains to be seen how the reduction of that car transportation results in reduction of CO2 emission. And then, you know, what's interesting is that some economists are saying that job growth and economic growth and alternatives will actually increase. And in that um, the initial question that, that we got earlier on wind farm uh, production per kilowatt hour being competitive with natural gas and, and oil is actually remaining competitive. Uh, so we probably still need some more time to study that. Uh, but alternatives, it, look like, it looks like as of right now, continue to be pretty stable. You know, one other aspect of this I should throw in there is that you know, we are a deregulated power market in Texas. So if we have a very hot summer and power needs continue to increase and exceed our capacity to produce that power, you know, it will rely upon all forms of energy um, in Texas. So it could be the case that it results in a rising tide of all forms of energy as uh, the demand picture uh, returns to Texas. Adina with the thank you. Thank you for the thank you. Jalen's asking, can we go back to school next year? Uh, um, as a parent of two, yes, I hope so. Uh, that's, that's the plan, it looks like. But uh, again, I think um, a lot of the experts are looking at possibilities in the event that there's a, a, a return of, of many more cases. Summer's question is, even though businesses are starting to open slowly over time, was this decision the right one? As you mentioned, there's a chance the second spike could appear. The decision could hurt the economy more. What's your view on this? You know, I, I'm a believer that we need to do this in a, in a smart way. We've, uh, at the land office, have been visiting with business owners, with nonprofits throughout the state in, in getting their viewpoints. And, and a lot of them need that opportunity to take that next step to, to reopen, but to do it in a smart way. And the governor has made those recommendations for all of us to follow social distancing guidelines. So at least I know that, you know, for example, here in Austin, we're all encouraged to wear masks when we, when we go out. You know, in terms of shaking hands and getting within six feet, you know, that, with folks that you haven't quarantined with, that, that is probably not recommended. Uh, so it will change our, our, our conduct. It'll change the way that we interact with other people for, for a good amount of time. But there's only so much that government can do. Ultimately, this, res this response relies upon the responsibility of individuals like yourself. And, uh, and, and so, if we're able to do our own part, it's, required, it's a truly a team effort. If we do our own part, um, we'll emerge from this stronger than ever and, um, and we'll be able to mitigate the, the, the recovery effort. So a question comes in, this pandemic uh, from Victoria, this pandemic is affecting everyone in different ways. How's it affecting you personally in your work? How so is it more of a challenge to complete your task? 
it really, you know, from my day-to-day -day perspective at the land office, it, it doesn't change too much. I, I, you know, I love, I'm, you know, I love hugging people. I love shaking hands. I love visiting with students throughout the state, but to be able to do this virtually is still, it's still possible. It's not the same, you know, as Jason pointed out um, in terms of interacting with students, but I, I'm still able to do my job. Um, personally, this, it's actually impacted me personally because I, I can't do the things that I, I, I used to like, and that's uh, being able to go to uh, a basketball game or um, a baseball game. I'm, I'm not able to go to my gym anymore, um, but you know, I'm a big reader. I'm able to read at home, um, keep my mental discipline um, and my game plan as it relates to my work. And so um, I'm, I'm sure the same is applied to virtually everybody on the call and throughout the state. So the next two questions actually tie into one another. Will our economy continue to drop and how long will it take to recover financially? You know, to put this historically, this is, if not larger than the 29 stock crash and the resulting 10 year depression in our country. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's really too early to tell in terms of how that recovery looks. Is it V-shaped? which I don't think it will be, uh, a U-shaped, I'm optimistic in saying that it will be, uh, and that the timeline is probably at least a year before we're able to stabilize uh, our economy. We, we need to, you know, even if businesses are able to reopen, a lot of consumers are reticent to go into Costco uh, or to Lowe's or to be able to go into, this have yet to be made, and I know, you know, anecdotally, you know, and statistically that a lot of Texans are being hesitant to, to jump right back into it. So until people feel comfortable that we can socially distance, but at the same time return to life as we knew it, whether it's going back to work or, or shopping, that, um, that will continue to have that impact on our, on our economy. So Philly is asking, wow, the techs are really coming in now. What would be the most feasible energy source in the future, considering life-changing factors such as the virus and other natural disasters? You know, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll continue to continue to produce alternative forms of energy in a cost-effective way. Even before the pandemic, people were making predictions that alternative energy will be a majority of power source by 2040. So it'll be your generation that will be a part of that and make that happen. Um, and you know there are some possibilities in which that is advanced even quicker because of um, the environmental impact of what we see uh, we have seen from um, not driving as much and and not uh, polluting the environment as much. Um, so those changes are taking place. And again, this summer is going to be very telling in terms of the uh, power production in Texas as to how that is all playing out and how power is purchased in the open market and whether or not wind and solar are a big part of that. So. Um, again, you know, I, I try to find, follow science and technology. Uh, a lot of research researchers in Europe are, are working on nuclear fusion. I know American scientists are part of that. Many scientists describe that as, as a game-changing form of energy. I know in Texas we're doing what we can to be an open business environment to allow entrepreneurs to examine these new sources of energy that can do that in a transformative way. Bianca asking a controversial question here, was it necessary to expand the role of the Railroad Commission to regulate the oil industry? You know, I, I think it was important to have that discussion in terms of proration. Our state has not prorated oil and gas production uh, dating back to the 1980s. Um, I had a ch chance to visit with one of the Railroad Commissioners that was a part of that discussion uh, back in those days, Kent Hans, who uh, oddly enough, beat my uncle for uh, President George W. Bush in a race for Congress in the uh, 1980s. And uh, we had a chance to talk about this issue. You know, he uh, said that it was important that if the state of Texas worked with other states like Oklahoma, New Mexico, other states in, that produce oil and gas, that that would make sense. And as Ray had asked before, partnering with Canada and Mexico in terms of a cost production, or I'm sorry, a production cut, that um, that would make sense. Um, but for the Railroad Commission to come in and, and require all uh, producers to reduce their production, that might have been an, an overstep. But I'm glad that they had the discussion and um, the debate because it was necessary. This is a critical industry for, for our state. 
Stephen's asking, do you have any books you would recommend for someone interested in personal development? Um, it's been a while that I've read a, a good book on, on personal development. Uh, I've been focusing a little bit more on biographies. I really love learning from business leaders, political leaders, military leaders. I just finished a, a biography on Napoleon, a really uh, interesting leader that probably rolled the dice a little bit too often especially as it led up to Waterloo in 1815. Uh, but in terms of personal development, I, I've always been inspired by um, business leaders like Steve Jobs, um, you know, by Bill Gates, and would encourage um, you know, the students really, if you have time, to, to pick up a biography on, on business leaders that created businesses from nothing. Um, in the oil and gas industry, there are many, including uh, Harold Hamm and um, Bill Milchell, who was the, the godfather of, of fracking, he invented that technique in the Barnett Shale, close to where I used to live in Fort Worth. And so uh, lots of great Texas business uh, pioneers that, um, that created something from nothing. So Elijah is asking if COVID-19 does not get better by July or August, will schools be closed through 2020? You know, that, that's, the, that's the fear. If you study the, uh, the caseloads of Texas, we continue to increase. Our death toll has, has stabilized. It's hitting even rural areas of our state. And so until we flatten and then decrease our curve, you know, will then leadership in Texas be more comfortable with opening schools um, in, in the fall or at least during the summer school time period. And so um, some epidemiologists also look at the seasonality of the virus. So with hotter temperatures, maybe that'll kill the virus a little bit uh, quicker on substances and areas where we pick up the virus. Um, so a lot to be learned really this summer. It'll be very crucial for, for how we reopen schools. And, and I know a lot of administrators are, up, are, are focusing on backup plans in the event that there is a, uh, a recovery of the, of the process. So Dean is asking, how do you suggest we go about our summer activities? If we have an internship, should we go in? If our summer camp is still happening, should we attend? Or do you suggest we keep up with social distancing and try getting the internship moved to online, not attend the summer camp? You know, that's ultimately a, a judgment call. Uh, a lot of employers like ourselves, we're reevaluating our entire summer internship program at the general land office, where we welcome college students, high school students, and uh, and even uh, graduate students, law students. And so um, we're looking at a digital process where we can assign work digitally and, and we would just return that information and, and have interaction like this one over the course of, of, of a week and a daily check-in. Um, but that's ultimately gonna be a call for you and your parents on whether or not to go in. I would imagine the summer camps that do open are going to require social distancing. I know the summer camps for my kids um, are moving completely digitally, um, whether that's uh, STEM-related or, um, or robot um, manufacturing. Favorite aspect of my job uh, from Maina, I, I would say that, um, you know, I would say it's visiting with you. I mean, I love, I love teaching. I love uh, visiting on the issues of the land office, the challenges we take on. Uh, after Hurricane Harvey, you know, now that we're close to three years, we've learned a lot about uh, not only recovering after a natural disaster, but preparing for the next one. And uh, that has been a true call to public service and really an honor of a lifetime to serve the state of Texas in that way. We'll close it out because I'm hearing that, uh, I guess we got to wrap it up at the end of the hour. Um, from Bianca as an incoming student that will attend a &M University in the fall. Congratulations, by the way, that's a really tough school to get into. Do you think a &M made a wise decision in opening their campus for fall 2020? Do you think it was too early to make the arrangement? No, I, I think it's the, the right call. I think we should all strive for